OG PlayStation had so many great games, and some of those were beat-em-ups. Since I'm a beat-em-up junkie, I thought I would talk about some of the best the console has to offer. So let's go. I hate the Batman Forever movie, but the beat-em-up is great. It's one of those rare instances in which the movie was bad, but the game is actually good. I covered this game in my list of arcade beat-em-ups, and this is the direct port of the arcade beat-em-up on the good old PS1. The game follows the plotline of the movie. You play as Mad Mardigan, I mean Batman, and team up with Boy Wonder, played by Spider-Man, I mean Chris O'Donnell, and take on the Joker and the Two-Face. This is a dark, fast-paced beat-em-up that has tons happening on screen, tons of power-ups to collect, and is easy to get lost in if you aren't paying attention. But the formula seems to work here. The gameplay is pretty easy to figure out. You get punch, kick, and jump buttons, and you mash them together to perform combos. Enemies drop a bevy of power-ups and they have colorful effects that add to the game's fun. You can also pull off moves by doing D-pad and button combinations, sort of like in Mortal Kombat, which was also made by Acclaim. You can totally see shades of Acclaim games in this one, including the digitized graphics and character models, as well as the MK booming voice. The enemies in this game mirror the movie and the bosses are right out of the comic book. Batman Forever the arcade game does a great job of emulating his arcade big brother, but I do have to say that I had a lot more fun playing the arcade game. It just looks better overall. But don't let that put you off from playing this game, it's still a good port. The game is a lot more fun with a friend, if you have one. Don't worry, the single player campaign is also quite fun. Batman Forever is one of these long forgotten games on the PS1 and I think it has a lot to do with the movie. No one remembers it either. But as far as the game goes, it's really unfair that it doesn't get the love that it deserves. Up next is Blade. I know, I know, another game based on a movie. Blade is an interesting game. It's not a beat-em-up per se, but it incorporates beat-em-up gameplay along with gunplay, which fans of the beat-em-ups will love. Blade does a lot of things right, but it does have some flaws, mainly the camera. It's complete jank, and it really shows the age of the game. At times, I had no idea where I was being hit from. In Blade, you wield a variety of weapons and can use both melee attacks and your trademark sword. Whether you are taking on human or supernatural enemies, you are going to make copious use of the lock-on button. As a matter of fact, without it, you won't get far at all. It's not a bad thing, but it's just another button that you have to push to beat people down. You can punch, kick, wield your swords, use items, and change guns and ammo types. Knowing which weapon to use against the enemies is also critical. The brute vampires and ninjas you fight are a lot easier to take down with your katana. The human, mostly gun-wielding enemies are best taken out by firearms. The game incorporates cutscenes into it, and for the most part, Blade looks a lot like Wesley Snipes. We play the character in the film, of course, but he sounds nothing like him. I mean, if you are going to call it Blade and model the characters after the actors, why not get their authentic voices in it? Did sir enjoy his flight? The cabin service was lousy. Where do your contact place the Von Espers? This game can be frustrating as there are not really easily accessible save points. You can't save on the fly and must reach restoration points that are scarce within the levels. And some of the restoration points are quite far away when you make a lot of progress in the game. The game has a lot of hidden rooms and items to collect. As I said, this game has a lot of non-traditional beat-em-up stuff in it, but I did have fun playing it. I just wish they would fix the camera and make the melee combat more intuitive. Man, oh man, I remember when ninjas ruled the world. You know, back in the 1980s. But ever since then, unless they are grotesque, green, cartoony, and love pizzas, they have faded from movies, video games, and other pop culture. So, when I started playing Ninja Shadow of Darkness for the good old PS1, my expectations were low. Boy, was I pleasantly surprised. This is a 3D isometric beat-em-up that I was having a serious problem putting down. Ninja Shadow of Darkness's gameplay is really quite simple. You can punch, kick, jump, and use ninja darts to annihilate your enemies. You can also murder your enemies in cold blood with ninja magic, and smoke bombs that do a really good job at keeping the ninja mystique going. You play as a young ninja warrior named Kurosawa, who returns to his homeland from a soul-searching journey only to find it overrun by demons. You vow to save your people from the evilness that has befallen your land when a greedy emperor unleashed demons hoping they would help him annihilate his rivals and become emperor of Japan. Little did he know that demons can't be controlled and they ended up turning on him and decimating Japan in the process. The story really doesn't matter, at least to me it doesn't. After all, we are talking about beat-em-ups. I'm happy with just killing, 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 killing. 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 
But this game offers more than just that. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is plenty of slaughtering to do, but you also have light puzzles to solve and some platforming. The game also has tons of items to collect and chests. If you see parts of the playfield glimmering, that means that there are some coins to be collected, so you must shoot them with your endless supply of ninja darts to get the treasure. The coins are used to buy power-ups when the stage is over. The game also lets you power up your attack, and once you do, you hit a lot harder and your darts become three-way shots. Super awesome! The enemies in this game aren't too difficult to beat at all, even the boss fights were easy. But hey, what do you expect? They're going up against a ninja master! The game also has a bunch of checkpoints you can use to make the game a lot more manageable. As I said before, I was having a really hard time putting this game down long enough to write my impressions of it. It's that damn good, and one of the best beat em ups that the PS1 has to offer. The game was made by Eidos and has that classic graphics and sound makeup that you see in games like Tomb Raider. And you know what? It works here too. That being said, the game does have its flaws, mainly with the camera and some of the detection, especially when you are platforming. It's a bit jank, but doesn't ruin the overall experience. Have you played this game? I spent some time with Gekido Urban Fighters for this episode, and I'm glad that I did. Uh, sort of. Gekido is a 3D polygonal beat-em-up that lived on the PS1. I actually had never heard of this game before prior to researching games for this episode. This game screams of PS1 era polygonal graphics, and I have to say, it has that 90s era's charm. The moves in this game can be a little bit frustrating, and there is some jankiness to be had, but I had fun playing this game as it doesn't take itself too seriously. You play as one of four heroes. There's a Bruce Lee wannabe, Testuo, the Blaze wannabe, Michelle, the Hagar wannabe, Ushi, and the Axel Stone looking dude, Travis, who is a master street fighter. The game relies heavily on combos, and as you do a bit of button mashing, you will discover them. The game's controls are a bit janky, and what I mean is, for example, you pick up items with your L2 button, instead of, you know, just standing over them and pushing the attack button like you do it with nearly every other beat em up. There are two attack buttons, a heavy and a light attack, and a kick button to round out the combos. There is also a rage meter that builds up with more ass kickery you dish out, which provides for stronger attacks. Alas, there are no dash attacks or character specific throws you can do, but there is an over the shoulder throw that all characters can do. Of course, each character has their strengths and weaknesses. You know, the big guy is tough, the skinny guy is fast but weak, the well rounded guy, well, you know the routine. The enemies and bosses in this game come at you quick and bring attacks to your face that you just won't be able to block. Sure, you can focus on an enemy with the R2 button, but it's not much help because at times the game can be cheap as the enemies hit you from all different directions. The power-ups in this game consist of food items that replenish your health, and you can also pick up and use a bevy of weapons, such as guns, grenades, and knives to issue carnage on the villains. The boss fights in this game can be challenging, Less so with an Amigo at your side. Jankiness aside, this is a solid beat em up with a great musical soundtrack featuring bands such as Fat Boy Slim that I can't show you due to copyright. The game also has some different modes including story mode and a versus mode. In all, this is a good game if you just want to do some mindless button mashing on the good old PS1. Before we get into the final game, let's take a look at some honorable mentions that I may or may not profile in a future episode. I've been waiting a while to talk about Xena the Warrior Princess, as this is a game that is rarely mentioned in the conversations regarding beat-em-ups. This is a game that I grew up playing back in the day and enjoy it even more now. 
Even though I never watched the show starring Lucy Lawless, I always liked this game. That's because it was probably the first game on the good old PS1 that I remember had that Golden Axe theme where you play as a barbarian ass kicker. In Xena Warrior Princess, you play as a main character and embark on different missions. I'm not sure if any of these were from the series, but you will be saving villagers, fighting Amazons and undead things, and using your boomerang like Chakram. This game is mostly played from a third person perspective, but to use a Chakram, you push the R1 button to get into the aim mode, then hit the attack button to throw the thing and get a behind the camera first person view. The aiming for this thing can be quite finicky, but you can get the hang of it eventually. If you miss the initial throw, you can always position the Chakram on its way back to try and take the enemies out. The game's combat is rounded out by a kick attack and the use of your sword and a bow stake in some occasions, like when you raid this Amazon village. You can use a variety of combinations on your enemies and if you press both the attack and kick button, you do this whirlwind attack. Other button combinations will let you attack in other ways. The game has quite a bit of light puzzle solving and platforming to add to the game's challenge. Most of the stages are fairly short and each of them have a couple of scrolls to find that provide tips on how to beat the level. The game's graphics are polygonal goodness and at times, I swore that the developers, Electronic Arts, were paying homage to Lara Croft. The graphics were good for their time. Although they don't hold up to today's graphics, it might be fun to see a remake of this game with today's hardware, probably a new Netflix series so we can figure out what the Xena story is all about. That being said, this is a pretty solid beat em up that mixes light puzzle solving and a unique weapon to use against your enemies to make for a good time on the good old PS1. And that's gonna be it for this episode of The Big Retro Show. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to the channel, leaving a thumbs up, and leaving a comment. And we'll see you next time on The Big Retro Show.